that, we are joined by Dr. Alone Burstein. Uh, he is a Israel Institute fellow at UCI. He's also a visiting assistant professor. Doctor, we appreciate you joining us as always. We want to get right into the breaking news of the evening here. Let's pull up this tweet. The United States and Britain carried out a series of airstrikes on military locations belonging to Iran-backed Houthis in Yemen uh, early today in response to the militant group's ongoing attacks on vessels traveling through the Red Sea. This is happening right now as far as we're aware, but we anticipated this would likely happen, Doctor. What do you think they are targeting in Yemen tonight? So first of all, thank you for having me as always. Um, the United States and the coalition that is operating the maritime force in the Red Sea stated already several days ago that they are going to be carrying out this strike. They said they're going to give the Houthis one final warning. And after that, they are going to carry out this strike sort of as a way to finally say, if we're going to, if you're going to continue attacking ships in the Red Sea, then there's eventually going to be a response. It's not just going to be a defensive maritime operation. That being said, it's unclear if this is going to be just a one-time strike, so to speak, if this is going to be a massive bombing campaign the last several hours against maybe different administration sites of the Houthis or possibly against different infrastructure, and then it'll be backed off. Or if what will happen is this is going to be the launching of a larger campaign. I don't, I don't think they're thinking invasion or anything like that. But it's unclear if this is now go going to be that the coalition is saying we're entering into a war as far as we're concerned with the Houthis, or if this is just a way to say from now on there's going to be retaliations. Every time you launch either drones or ballistic missiles or try to go over a ship, it's not just going to be that the coalition of ships is going to try to defend them, but rather it's going to be there's going to be retaliations. You're going to start paying a price. I think that's what the United States of the coalition is trying to establish right now. There's changing the rules of the game, so to speak. The Wall Street Journal reported that uh, in anticipation of the attack, Houthi forces transported some weapons and equipment and fortified others. Uh, local reports indicate that Houthi militants were evacuating the Red Sea city of Hudaydah. Uh, the Houthi leader said yesterday that any U.S. attack on Yemen's Houthis will not go without a response. Um, you know, what kind of response are the Houthis capable of? So this is a little bit why I suggested that this is not the United States trying to carry out a surprise attack in order to assassinate the leader of the Houthis or something like that. This was coming. The Houthis knew this was coming. The United States and the United Kingdom said this was coming. The UN Security Council passed a resolution two days ago stating that the Houthis need to stop all of their activity. This is also the United States and the coalition trying to gain this international legitimacy in order to carry out this attack. So the attempt here was to show that we're changing the rules. What is going to happen likely is, much like we see between Israel and Hezbollah, we're probably going to start seeing between the international coalition and the Houthis. We're going to see now each side saying, okay, you carried that out. Now the Houthis are probably going to try to, in a day or two, launch several ballistic missiles and hit an American ship. They'll succeed. They won't succeed. The coalition will then retaliate. What's happening is we're going to see an escalation in the back and forth. What really remains to be seen is if one of those actions, either the actions of the coalition in Yemen or, in turn, the Houthi attacks, if one of them go too far, so to speak, let's say the Houthis do manage to target either a civilian ship or a, mar or a military ship and destroy it or sink it or if the coalition's forces actually do manage to assassinate a top Houthi leader or some Iranian revolutionary guards are in Yemen or something like that, then we'll see, you know, a next jumping and a next escalation. Right now, probably we're going to see in the next couple of days is the establishment of the parameters of what's going to be a retaliation versus a retaliation. And then we'll see where things, where things go and develop. But really what, like, what we're waiting for is the next spark. Okay, so after that, what is now going to be the next um, sort of parameters that we go to? Right now, we're still figuring it out. It's unclear how long this attack is going to be, right? This could be 10 targets are reported attacked. That could be it. Could be another 100 coming tonight. Unclear. Now, we also want to talk about uh, Iran seizing a tanker with Iraqi crude oil destined for Turkey in retaliation for the confiscation last year of the same vessel and its oil by the U.S. Uh, the seizure of this ship uh, alone coincides with these Houthi Red Sea attacks. The White House says... There was no justification uh, whatsoever uh, for this uh, event. Uh, so when we talk about something like that, what do you make of the timing of something like this breaking while we're also seeing this breaking news tonight? So again, I think Iran knew, obviously, that this attack was going to happen today or tomorrow, right? They also have their intelligence, and it was not a, it was not a big secret that this attack was coming. And I think the timing 
is meant to show that Iran is prepared, as far as they're concerned, to expand the circle of conflict. Already we saw two weeks ago that Iran launched drones from Iran itself, not activating its militias like Hezbollah or the Houthis or Hezbollah in Iraq, launched drones from, from Iran itself to attack ships that are somewhat associated with Israel in the Indian Ocean. That's sending a signal. That's saying, okay, we are prepared to also expand the conflict, and now ships that are possibly in the Indian Ocean will be targeted. Now Iran's sending the same type of message. It's sort of trying to remind the United States, you can go and bomb Yemen, but remember, we can start also like nitpicking against your ships that are coming out through around Saudi Arabia, where, or around Kuwait, or around Bahrain. So Iran is trying to send a signal with this. It's doing it, in, again, in a way that's not breaking the rules of the game. It didn't attack a ship, or it did not, sorry, it attacked a ship, obviously. It did not send missiles against the ship. It did not sink a ship. It's specifically a ship that had Iraqi crew on it. So again, that's saying it's not poking the bear in the sense that it's declaring war in the United States. It's saying we're willing to up the ante. It's a sick game that goes on in the Middle East, right? It's constantly saying, are we going to break the rules of the game or are we going to go to full-out war? Each side is saying, no, I'm going to up it a little, I'm going to up it a little. Iran is trying to send a signal. We're willing to up the ante and start attacking your ships also outside of the Babu Mandab Straits and the areas of the Red Sea. Just be aware of that. That's, I think, what they're trying to signal with this. We'll be watching the Red Sea closely. We'll be watching Yemen closely as this story develops overnight. Let's pull up uh, this tweet. Uh, we do want to move over to Gaza. An Israeli government spokesperson posted this earlier today, saying that families set up massive loudspeakers on the Gaza border, hoping their loved ones can hear them down in the Hamas tunnels. Uh, today, the IDF also posted video. Let's make sure we get that up as well. Uh, because they posted videos of some of the tunnels underground in the southern Gaza city of Han Yunus, which has become the focus of Israel's ground offensive. Several hostages uh, freed in a ceasefire deal in late November, November, doctor, described being held inside tunnels. Um, where does this hostage situation stand for now? Have we heard any major developments as of late? Right now, all the parties involved, um, with the exception of Hamas and Israel, they're sort of waiting to see what develops with the parties involved. Qatar, Egypt, other mediators are trying to reignite the hostage negotiations. Hamas froze all hostage negotiations after the assassinations of Salah Halauri. And as far as Hamas is concerned, they have said they're not returning to negotiations unless the opening step is a complete ceasefire. Only after a ceasefire are they willing to return to negotiations. That's a very high card to play. Chances are that they're going to go to negotiations even without that. But there's also right now a problem within Hamas. The leadership is very divided. There's the leadership abroad, the official leadership, is Ismail Ania, who is abroad, sitting in Qatar. He is officially, according to the organization's ranks, the leader of Hamas. However, the internal, or, the internal leadership, yet led by Yahya Sinwar, according to reports that came out today, has started to make its own decisions and doesn't actually need to answer to the leadership abroad because there's no sanctions that could go against them. They're the ones that are in charge on the ground. So it's also unclear who could be the one from Hamas's side to actually initiate any negotiations right now. In turn, in Israel, there's a lot of pressure on the war cabinet and the cabinet in general to come up with a deal to return the hostages. There's a lot of internal growing pressure from the families of hostages in Israel. They're starting massive campaigns. What, this thing with the loudspeakers is one of them. This is more for public opinion in Israel to just try to keep this in the news, more than I think trying to actually make the families hear them. It's trying to say, we're still here, and we're going to keep on reminding the Israeli public that we still have the hostages there. In terms of actual developments in the deal, Qatar put forth two days ago a proposal that it said that it has a three-phase proposal, that they would start with a truce, and, is, and the IDF would withdraw from the centers of cities. Then there would be a hostage exchange, and the IDF would completely withdraw from the Gaza Strip. And after that, Hamas leadership would go to exile, which is an idea that harks back to the 80s in fights between Israel and the PLO. Israel looked at this with a lot of skepticism, said that's a weird deal that we didn't hear about, that they said that they put forth, and the head of the Mossad called Qatar and one of the clarifications. In turn, the leaders of Hamas also said, We've never heard of this deal, and we don't know what Qatar is talking about. So there's a lot of speculation that Qatar was mostly trying to just fan the flames, just try to say, let's get a deal going. We're going to say that we're talking to get the sides to at least respond and deny this. Meanwhile, in Egypt, there's also a lot of talk about a potential deal. Different delegations from Israel have arrived in Egypt in the last couple of days, and there was even an urgent message from the head of 
Egyptian intelligence, Abbas Kamal, to the heads of Hamas and Palestinian Islamic Jihad, saying, come to Cairo. Come to Cairo. There may be a deal that you want to talk about. The heads of the Hamas said, no, we're not talking deals right now. The deal is you start with a ceasefire. So there's a lot of talk. Egypt and Qatar are trying to push things forward. In reality, though, there's not even the semblance of a breakthrough. Both sides are sort of waiting for something to entice them to the table. And that's where things stand right now, unfortunately. And, uh, Doctor, let's move to the United Nations. That's another big story that's uh, taking a lot of headlines uh, in the later half of this week. Today, South Africa formally accused Israel of committing genocide against Palestinians and pleaded with the United Nations top court to order an immediate halt to the Israeli military operation in Gaza. The AP says that Israeli leaders have taken the rare step of engaging with the court to defend their international reputation. This is expected to be a years-long process, as you and I have talked about. But what would it take uh, for the South Africans to prove their case in the long run? So in proving such cases, right, the definitions of genocide are obviously, like anything legal, much more complicated than most people think. Right? Genocide, you're trying to kill everyone in a population, that's it. There's legal definitions of what genocide means, and it could mean also the systematic killing of an entire group or part of a group. If you're trying to systematically kill part of a group, it could also mean if you're systematically starving a group or systematically avoiding uh, withholding uh, medical supplies from a group. Like all these things that South Africa is trying to prove because even South Africa is not making the claim that Israel is systematically assassinating everyone in the Gaza Strip. Instead, it's relying on all these other things. There's two sides that need to be proven when you try to hold a country accountable for genocide. One is the actions. You have to be able to prove that the actions meet a certain level of guilt. And, in t- and the other is intent. You have to be able to prove that the actions are not just a byproduct of war, right? Because in war, you often have hunger. You often have, you often have humanitarian catastrophes. But it's very hard to prove intent usually. And you have to try to prove both those things. In this case, the situation is almost reversed. It's very easy for South Africa to ironically prove intent. That is not to say that Israel actually is carrying out a genocide in Gaza. But what I can say, and what South Africa is saying, is there are scores of statements that were made by the Prime Minister, the Minister of Defense, Minister of National Security, other members of Cabinet, saying things like, burn Gaza down. There are no innocent people in Gaza. We will not let a single stitch of food into Gaza. All these inflammatory statements prove intent. They say the Israeli leadership is openly saying that this is going what they're going to do and that that can amount to genocide. That being said, South Africa is going to have a much harder time proving that this actually happened on the ground because a lot of things did happen that are obviously are causing a humanitarian catastrophe. Humanitarian aid was withheld from the Gazans for many weeks. There is massive hunger in Gaza. But to prove that this is with the intent of systematically killing either the entirety or of a portion of the population is going to be much harder. So in this case, ironically, the situation is a little bit reversed. Often when you have you know, disasters of war, Afghanistan, Iraq, Kosovo, South Sudan, when you have disasters of war, you see the results on the ground and you can say, look, clearly war crimes, clearly genocide, but it's hard to prove the intent of the leadership. Whereas here, ironically, it's a lot easier to prove that the leadership has said lots of things that can amount to these crimes Proving them on the ground, though, is going to be much harder. Just as an example, some of the figures that the representatives in South Africa said today, 80% of starving people in the world are in the Gaza Strip. That's, that's factually not true. Unfortunately, there are, according to UN figures, upwards of 800 million people that are suffering from hunger in the world. So that's a, factually, that's a factual mistake. So they're going to have a hard time proving the actual facts, but they can prove the intent. I'll just say one more thing. Um, they're asking for an immediate injunction, the court to put out an immediate ruling before the case actually, you know, goes to trial. One thing that's important to remember is while they're asking the court to put out an immediate order that Israel has to halt its activities in the Gaza Strip, the court can put out other orders. So it, it can say it's not going to put out an immediate order to halt things in the Gaza Strip, but it can put out an immediate order saying that Israel is required to allow all humanitarian aid trucks to come in without inspection. Or Israel is allowed, like the court is, has the authority to rule on a lot of other things. So it remains to be seen what the judges actually say, because even if South Africa does not get its way, other immediate orders may come into effect next week already. Where do you see this case going in the immediate future? Do you, do you see this impacting the war in, in any way immediately? 
I see it impacting the war in two ways. Um, one is already in Israel, there is a lot more caution. Already in Israel, the IDF today was very careful to put out messages about the number of aid trucks that are allowed in, and also to say that the IDF has never stopped any aid trucks from coming into Gaza, which is also factually not true. But the, the IDF is starting to be careful, and it's starting to realize that it needs to build a better international reputation for itself. So that's one thing that, regardless of the outcomes in Israel, they're starting to realize. The bigger outcomes, though, are going to be diplomatic. If the court orders Israel to do something, either stop the war in Gaza, stop the bombings in Gaza, allow humanitarian aid in, or, or anything else, right? there's no one to compel Israel to do that. But if that is the case, and Israel does not oblige by the rule court's ruling, it is going to be very hard for the United States to continue backing Israel so unequivocally the way it, the way it has. It's going to be very hard for the Israel to rely on the EU to continue backing it. And the diplomatic pressure on Israel to adhere to whatever the court says is going to be monumental. That could have a lot of repercussions because Netanyahu's government is very fragile. It relies heavily on very hawkish right-wing elements who are sort of saying, yeah, the UN says that, so be it, we don't care. And if the diplomatic pressure compels Israel to actually adhere to what the court says, that could threaten the cohesion of the government, and the cohesion of the government in turn affects the war. So even if the court ruling is not necessarily binding in the sense that no one's going to go force Israel on the ground, you know, stand in front of the IDF, it will have repercussions later on. It remains to be seen what the court actually rules, though. Like In that, in that sense, we'll know. There's no time limit, as far as I know, um, on when do they have to rule by the South Africa's request, but they're supposed to do it as fast as possible. My guess is that will be already next week. And we want to move uh, to the uh, Anthony Blinken. Uh, this is the last thing I want to touch before we go here. Uh, Blinken uh, making another urgent swing through the Middle East, uh, meeting with Israeli officials, meeting with Palestinian officials in the West Bank yesterday, and as you see on your screen, wrapping up his trip uh, in Egypt, meeting in Cairo today with the Egyptian President, uh, doctor, what did you make of the trip overall? Uh, he did mention uh, the fact that it would be hard uh, for Israel to navigate uh, the immediate future, or at least in the immediate years, uh, without uh, perhaps discussing some sort of two-state solution. Uh, what are your takeaways from Blinken's latest visit? My guess is he's frustrated. He came to Israel to hear the day after plan, to hear, okay, what is Israel actually going to do? He did not get that, at least according to all reports and all leaks. The expanded cabinet in Israel was due to meet about the day after plan yesterday. And when the meeting started, Prime Minister Netanyahu announced, we're not talking about that today. So Israel seemingly does not have a plan, and Anthony Blinken did not get that. He then went to the Palestinian Authority, and there mounted heavy pressure on the Palestinian Authority to begin massive internal reforms. Because the United States wants the Palestinian Authority to assume control of the Gaza Strip. And Israel is saying that's never going to happen, but the United States is saying, well, there'll be a major reform in the Palestinian Authority, it will be a different governing body, and then maybe you can trust it. According to leaks from the meeting, despite the fact that Anthony Blinken afterwards said that he, pre he understands that the chairman is committed to reform, according to leaks from the meeting, nothing like that was said. In fact, the chairman Abbas's response was, the United States, you need to reform your position towards the Palestinians. So he's likely fr frustrated there. He also wanted to mount pressure on Israel to begin a formulating a plan to allow Palestinians that have been displaced, and there are 1.9 million internally displaced Palestinians, 90% of the population of Gaza internally displaced. He wanted Israel to start formulating a plan for them to move back up north. Up north in the Gaza Strip is completely destroyed. For that, you have to have an entire infrastructure of rebuilding the northern parts of the Gaza Strip. He did not get any plans with Israel. He agreed with Israel that a UN commission would be allowed to go to the northern parts of the Gaza Strip in order to start investigating what has to be done. Egypt today wanted to veto that because Egypt is terrified that a UN commission in northern parts of the Gaza Strip will find that the north is uninhabitable and therefore will pressure Egypt to allow refugees to come in to Sinai. So Anthony Blinken certainly touched on all the points and he put pressure on everyone that he wanted to put pressure. At least from the leaks that are coming out from the different meetings, I think that he's probably leaving very frustrated because everyone is telling him what's not going to happen. No one is actually formulating a plan for what is going to happen, which is what the United States wants. Dr. Alon Burstein, we'll leave it there for now. Thank you, as always, for joining us. Thank you. Have a good night.